And we are joined now by Matt Huber, professor of, uh, at Syracuse University and author of Climate Change is Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for being here um, and doubling up on the maths today. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so I... I I mentioned this at the start of the show that I this the, many of the ideas that you discuss in your book have um, I I've been debating them with certain people um, just the like the the overemphasis on individual consumption versus a larger critique of production and having this be at the feet of the government as opposed to individuals and largely individuals who have the means uh, mm. and the time to engage in uh, uh, the, the process of cutting back on certain aspects of their consumption. So let's talk about that core tension that you explore in the book, consumption versus production as an emphasis on, on, uh, on climate change. Yeah, um, the, f the first thing to say is that we've kind of almost been trained to only think about the climate change and responsibility through consumption, where, where we, get these carbon footprint calculators and we think about you know what we do in our homes how we drive whether we're, what we eat uh, how we fly whether or not we have children like all these actions we do in the market as consumers get can be traced to various kinds of emissions um and that way of thinking just pretty much erases the role of the the people that own and control and profit from production and um so, you know, like when you when you think of your carbon footprint as like driving and emitting a certain amount of emissions, like you're you're totally ignoring the role of the oil company that sold you that gasoline that's powering your car and and they're making all the money, they're making all the profit from that. And and in a in a larger sense like our energy system is an incredibly um complex social system of production. You know, like the the electric grid is it, it, it's crazy. It has to be balanced, like supply and demand. So you have all these actors who are provisioning electricity to us. And, and that, um, if we were, you know, focusing on that relationship of production um, is a lot more straightforward than all these kind of scattered um, consumption acts. And, um, you know, the production is, uh, you, like, for instance, if you were to take, uh, a coal-fired uh, electric grid and turn it over to clean energy, the consumption acts can be the exact same, but they would be, from a climate perspective, completely different. Um, so what the book tries to do is to say, really, the struggle over climate change is really about how we produce not just energy, but the things that use energy in our economy, like steel plants and cement plants and agriculture and all the all these productive uh, infrastructures that use a lot of energy, like that's what we have to transform. So in a kind of old school kind of socialist way, like about seizing uh, the means of production, like that's actually what this struggle is about. It's about really um, taking control over a system that's run for profit by capital, who controls it to just make money, to try to say we need to totally transform this energy production system to uh, decarbonize it and make sure it it runs on clean energy so we can, you know, save the planet from being uninhabitable. Um, so there's a lot of other things I could say about how focusing on consumers and carbon footprints really distracts. Like even when you focus on the rich and their sort of high emitting. That was going to be my next question, right? Because like yeah. just focusing on individual wealthy people's consumption is, but where are they consuming from, right? Exactly. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, you have three pools at your three houses and you're, you're flying to Timbuktu or wherever you're going, like, like the, that, that, it, but you are consuming from someplace, no matter how wealthy you are. And by only focusing on what they're using their money for as rich people, we don't look at how they make their money. Yeah. And that activity is going to have way more carbon impact. So you could take a CEO of a fossil fuel company that spends like 12 hours a day, like managing a global network of fossil fuel extraction uh, production systems. And yeah, maybe they might go home into their heated uh, pool that uses a lot of energy, but their, their activity 
of being a fossil fuel exec is way more impactful than what they're doing in their private consumption life. And, and that's, you know, really the where the power is. Because the other thing is, you know, when we think about our responsibility only in terms of consumers, we act as if the capitalist market system is really just this um, free market where consumer dispersed decentralized consumers are the, have the power to kind of choose and shape demand. And that's what's driving the economy. That's what shapes production. But, you know, a, a left perspective would say that's not how the economy works. It's really controlled by a small minority of owners who own production, who profit from these systems. And they're the ones with the real power. And so that's where we, we really have to, to pay attention because, um, Emma, I think you actually brought this up when we talked about this long ago. But like when you only look at someone's consumption, um, you could look at like a Hollywood actor who has a really a mansion and drives a Hummer and a private jet and compare that person with a fossil fuel executive um, who takes public transit and is a vegetarian. And you would conclude that the Hollywood actor has more impact on the climate compared with the owner of fossil capital. It just makes absolutely no sense to think about it that way. So um, we're really missing a lot when we only look at, at the consumptive realm, that's for sure. And even on a rhetorical level, like, I mean, one, you mentioned that the solution that you're talking about is so much more straightforward. And, and uh, my experience in covering politics is that often straightforward answers are a little bit scary for capitalists because it involves uh, a, a a class struggle. Um, mm -hmm. And the simple answer usually always boils down to that. But But even from a political rhetorical level, like... Democrats focusing on, um, we'll just use this country as an example because I'm most familiar with it, but any, any like center left party, whatever, focusing on uh, individual consumption as a way to combat climate change is a, like a gift to the right wing because mm -hmm. it, 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 it's an impossible bar to meet. It also is targeted at a certain class of likely suburbanites, upper middle class types who have the ability to engage in that kind of behavioral change because of wealth and uh, time and the, the kinds of education that they probably received. Like it is almost working in tandem with the Democrats saying basically we're only going to focus on winning over suburban voters mm -hmm. who are disaffected by Trump. Like that's that is the kind of person that they're tailoring that towards, and that has zero broad appeal. Yeah, I mean, you can listen to what the right says about climate politics, and they say this is a a conspiracy amongst a liberal elite that's trying to concoct these policies in Washington that are ultimately meant to change your life, to make your life worse, to make your life cost more, and to make uh to make you sort of adopt this sort of um, goody goody, uh, like, you know, like vegan lifestyle or whatever. And, and that resonates with a working class that's been beaten down and um, basically suffering through this kind of highly unequal capitalist system for the last 40, 50 years. And so the right's able to kind of mobilize this, um, this kind of opposition to climate on the basis of a kind of class appeal that says this is going to cost your life economically. And you're, you're absolutely right. Like a lot of liberals just play right into it because a lot of their politics ultimately is about kind of performing this low carbon virtuous life and uh, performing this kind of um, uh, this, this, in, these individual consumption acts and that, you know, we need to get beyond that and actually speak to how we can combine climate action with um, policies that actually improve people's lives, make their uh, access to energy systems more secure and things like that. So. And in terms of who's driving uh, the, co the climate conversation, let's talk about the makeup of, of those people and how it probably influences the rhetoric, because um, yeah. I think that fits well into what we, we just touched on. Um, P using PMC can seem maybe just a little uh, tired to a degree, but that is the that is the th those are the kinds of people, right? Who who uh, are in charge of this discourse? Um, I mean, yes, it's scientists too, but you know, relying on data to sell your political 
project is not a good way to go. Um, but but maybe if you can expand on that, how the makeup of the people, um, the kinds of pr professional types who are leading climate discourse has affected the way that it's been uh, been portrayed. Yeah, it's it's funny. I proposed I, I submitted the book proposal in 2017 that was going to be anchored in this very PMC analysis. Uh, and for those that don't know, it's a the professional managerial class was a concept coined by Barbara and John Ehrenreich in, Ehrenreich in the 1970s. And then after 2017, basically the left blew up <laughs> with this debate over the PMC and it polarized the the 2020 primary between the Bernie and Warren factions, and it became this extremely polarizing concept. And but I had to soldier through because I really think it's important to thinking about climate politics. Because if you look around about who's really driving climate advocacy, it is what you would call the professional managerial class. And I would actually include scientists as really a big part of that class. People, the way I define it in the book is people that try to marshal credentials of some kind to carve out advantages in the labor market. And that can be degrees or licenses or any any types of things. But essentially, it's mostly like using hyper uh, educated degrees to kind of um, create these kind of professional, um, secure middle class types of advantages in the labor market. And so we're talking about science, academics, scientists, journalists, um, People that work at NGOs, staffers at NGOs, uh, government uh, bureaucrats, agents, people like this. And this is the kind of class of people that are most um, vocal about climate change. And um, essentially, like, there's a, you know, there's a couple things that kind of define this class project from a, in a kind of material and ideological sense. The first would be that they because they're so um, invested in using credentials and knowledge to gain these advantages, they're, they're really into making climate politics really about science and knowledge and belief, believing the science and belief in denial, and, uh, and, and really vilifying the right, uh, not because they sanction fossil fuel extraction for profit, but more because they fund denial and they're denying the truth and they're doing a war against facts or whatever. And this really came to a fever pitch in the Trump years, right? Because it was just this sort of like from an administration that was denying truth, denying science. And if you recall, we had a march for science. And if you kind of just go on mm. Google, go on Google images and look at like the types of folks that went out to the march for science. And that can be seen as like a mass action of the professional class. And um, the other thing about this class is, uh, and there's a debate on whether or not we should call them a class. You could call them a stratum or a class, whatever. But um, is that they, you know, the class project is about attaining some level of material economic security, like a sort of a middle class uh, job in academia and journalism or whatever it might be. And so that, for and, and again, we should be clear that that's becoming more and more out of reach for much of what could be called the PMC, like people that follow sort of DSA politics will probably be familiar with this idea that DSA is kind of this place where downwardly mobile college educated people are fleeing to and people that are working low wage working class jobs, but have these credentials because there's just not jobs anymore for these types of credentialed people. But the goal, obviously, is to try to use these credentials to gain this kind of middle class security. But with that, come with middle class security comes this level of consumption that is comfortable and might involve like owning a car and even owning a home, maybe. And so that and maybe like having to fly a lot for professional uh, exp, exp, uh, sort of professional reasons. And so with this middle class security, the a lot of the PMC discourse becomes really focused on their own consumption as the driver because they're so they're participating at such a high level in these systems of consumption they feel like instead of blaming the owners of production that i said before are really to blame they blame themselves and say it's really you know i'm um engaging in this uh, high consumption lifestyle uh um uh while the world burns and so there's this level of what i call carbon guilt and feelings of complicity and so those are kind of the 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 two 
forms of climate politics that um, I see really predominant amongst this this PMC group. It, it's not a coincidence that coincidence that the same group of people uh, are all about like lean in style feminism, um, uh, white fragility style racial reckoning, and also individualistic. <laughs> climate uh climate action like those things can all fit in some sort of thesis that i i haven't been able to flush out yet or you could just call them pmc and be done with it really well i don't know if you've ever had Catherine Liu on but she wrote a book on the pmc called virtue hoarders and to me that title <laughs> it just really does get at a lot a of what's one. going on here basically virtue and and projecting it as this 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 sort of um stuff that's really not of the masses right because part of the the pmc thing is kind of sneering at the masses you know the people that go to the mall or something are are are, are what's really destroying climate change and and so hogging this kind of virtue by putting solar panels on your roof or eating organic or going vegan like this becomes the the, the key uh kind of politics and and you can translate it to all uh, various other forms, as as you just said. So let's talk about the strategies that uh, the the three strategies that you lay out that this this group of folks, um, scientists, yes. PMC types, you know, whatever, lawyers, um, journalists, etc., seem to emphasize. Uh, and we've talked about it, I guess, uh, you know, a good amount. But if you don't mind giving those three points uh, and, and um, laying that out for us. So I, I, I kind of lay out three archetypes of the PMC climate activists. The first is what I call the science communicator. And I've talked a lot about that, which is essentially, but it, it does subscribe to this very kind of liberal theory of change that if the masses really understood the not and knew the truth about climate change, then action would inevitably follow in a democracy, which I think more and more we're seeing that we don't really live in a democracy. Um, but uh, this, this idea that the real problem with the climate crisis is denial of the science and we just need to kind of make people aware. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of prominent climate scientists who have become really you know, powerful spokespeople, but I think there's also a whole kind of cadre of journalists and other, I don't know, I guess you call them influencers now who are really sort of invested in what the science has to say and like trying to fight denial of it, right? So the science communicators. The next one is what I call the policy technocrats. And these are the folks that um, really propose a whole set of like policy technocratic fixes to the climate crisis. And these really emerged in the 1980s and 90s. It's sort of during the heyday of the kind of neoliberal revolution towards free market policies. And, and these policy technocrats sort of deeded the ground and said, okay, the right Reagan revolution has won we need to design kind of really clever, smart policies that are grounded in in free market ideas that can win over not only Democrats, but they, they even have the idea that they can win over Republicans with these really smart technocratic policies. Now, these are things like carbon taxes or uh, cap and trade type market where you can like trade emission credits that give people certain rights and property rights to pollute. And, and then create a market in these emission rights. And, and um, uh, ultimately it boils down to this idea that the market is not adequately pricing the emissions of climate change so that if we can just get the prices right and internalize these emission, the cost of these emissions through, through carbon pricing, then the market will just solve it naturally. And so the policy technocrats have been banging this drum for decades about how smart this policy is of carbon pricing. Let's put a price on carbon. Um, but, you know, as as we've hinted at before, like it it might be smart to them. But when you actually try to implement this, it ultimately leads to um, raising the price of energy. <laughs> And you you see how uh, I mean we're just seeing that now with inflation. But in, you know in France when Macron tried to implement a fuel tax on the on the under the banner of climate action, it led to this kind of working class revolt amongst the yellow vest. You know they've tried to pass a carbon tax in in the very like green liberal state of Washington in 2016 and 2018. It failed miserably. So these very smart solutions uh, amongst the technocrats are not popular. They're not 
they're not even trying to like have mass appeal. They just sort of appeal to these very policy oriented people. And um, one of the organizations I profile is called the Citizens Climate Lobby. And their kind of flagship policy is something called a carbon fee and dividend. And one of their slogans is we're going to outsmart climate change. And to me, that really <laughs> epitomized <laughs> this idea that like we're, we're really smart. We're going to come up with these smart policies and we're going to outsmart this horrific uh, global planetary thing that's facing us. And the idea that we're going to outsource the the uh, the effects of climate change or the um, consequences of it to regular people in the form of like some sort of individual taxation, as opposed to just targeting the producers, the capitalists, the oil executive not, or the, the oil companies at the crux of this. I mean, you, you mentioned France there and uh, this. France just just, uh, you know, nationalized. It's um, I think yesterday. This is not yeah. an oil, yeah. uh, an oil company. I believe it's nuclear and other kinds of energy, yeah. but its largest uh, utility company mm -hmm. after the war in Ukraine has basically just caused uh, so much. Uh, I mean, talk about the free market failing in terms of energy. We're seeing that right now with gas prices and um, the 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 way that um, you know, oil producers are holding the rest of the world hostage to this degree. Yeah. Like, we need to be talking about nationalizing these oil companies. And that is the most straightforward solution, in my opinion. Um, but but when you talk about outsmarting climate change, it's hilarious to me that the smartest solution is the simplest one that we keep yeah. returning to. And yeah. what, you, what, the, what outsmarting climate change really means is how can we burden regular people more with, by avoiding through our own cowardice and uh, inability to actually stand up to powerful people, mm -hmm. targeting the, the targeting the companies, the production of the uh, of oil and uh, of uh, of what's causing the worst of climate change. Yeah, I came up when I was writing this book. I came up with a little pithy slogan that 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 we should not tax molecules, we should tax the rich, <laughs> which is, it, it's insane because the idea of a carbon tax, carbon is this neutral stuff that working class people use, you and I use, rich people use, and this idea that it, it's causing climate change, we're gonna tax this neutral stuff. It, it can easily be turned into something that's gonna be a tax on everyone, right? And and no one likes that. <laughs> so you know, traditionally, when the left was powerful, the the main way the left got stuff done is through re mass redistribution of of wealth, and that's through taxing the rich. And so we need to we need a massive uh, and and the taxing of the rich. And and by the way, over the last forty years, nothing but tax cuts for the rich. You know, from Reagan through W through Trump, like that's just what they've been doing. And so we could, and that even you know like. If we don't even want to, I mean, obviously, I'm all on board for nationalizing the energy sector. I think that's something ultimately we have to do. But if we could just like make our tax regime way more progressive and generate a huge amount of revenue to to actually invest in the in in remaking our energy system and remaking our infrastructure, like that kind of big, let's say like New Deal style sort of public goods public investment regime. Uh, and, you know, in the New Deal, they tax the rich at these incredible levels, too. That's what we need. And, and focusing on the molecules sort of distracts us from this class struggle that we're facing uh, and, and what we need to do to, to solve it. It is. Um, I, I'm hoping we can uh, flesh out the, the class struggle element even more, um, because as, as you mentioned and, and we talked about, people dominating discourse uh, are the professional managerial types, et cetera. Poor people are essentially left out of um, climate debate and not just poor people within the United States, but the global South is largely uh, ignored and the global South is going to bear the brunt mm -hmm. of how um, uh, of, of climate change as it continues to wreak havoc on the planet. Um, can you talk about that dynamic and particularly how global capitalism has made uh, nations in the global south vulnerable and how at the same time they're also given zero voice for the most part in um, in the international climate debate? 
Yeah, well, I would actually tweak that a little because I think when you go into these PMC climate, it's often they often call them like climate justice spaces, and and actually they they are very keen on um, they will they would say centering the the frontline communities that are going to bear the worst consequences of climate change. And the whole conception of climate justice is that these poor marginalized communities like indigenous peoples and peasant communities who who are really trying to subsist from the land and from nature directly and are seeing droughts and floods and horrific consequences right directly. Um, and, and I think that's super important um, in this climate justice framing is really powerful morally. Um, but what that framing leaves out is that it focuses so on this kind of very small marginalized populations that it, it leaves out the, the greater mass of of the working class, as I would say, in a capitalist society, because um, most of us don't actually rely on the land for our subsistence. <laughs> and most of us are just, you know, trying to survive in the market by gaining a wage or an income. And, and so this kind of constant focus on these frontline communities and marginalized communities, ultimately, like is creating this somewhat minoritarian politics that doesn't quite, uh, you know, doesn't really speak to the greater masses of the working class. So what I argue is that we actually, they actually build the kind of power to deliver for those poor marginalized groups that are really suffering under, you know, sometimes directly by fossil capital, like, you know, like extraction and refineries and all these horrific projects like the, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline going through Standing Rock and all these things, you know, to, to win on those struggles, we actually need to defeat you know, the same people, oil companies, <laughs> uh, big, big capital, we need to, we need to build the power to defeat them. And to do that, you actually need to appeal, not just to the, the morality of these disenfranchised, marginalized groups, but the you need to appeal to the broader mass of the working class. So um, what I argue, and, you know, it wasn't just me, it's like, I think that the, the genius of the idea of a Green New Deal was that it was going to be a climate program that basically centered just these sort of material gains for everyday working people in a highly unequal capitalist system. So things like a job guarantee, uh, Medicare for all, things um, like instead of a carbon tax, how about cheaper, even free electricity as a human right? Like these kinds of public goods delivering material gains to the broader masses of working class people um, could be a way to actually build the power. And then, and then ultimately, I think when you bring up this global south issue, it's it's really important to realize that in terms of global emissions, um, historically, the United States is by far the greatest emitter. It's by far the worst, uh, you know, violator of international. It's always the the agent in these international uh, treaty negotiations, whether it be Copenhagen or Kyoto or wherever it was last year, I'm blanking, <laughs> but it's the United uh, States. Scotland, right? Glas I think Glasgow. So. Glasgow. Yeah, Glasgow. Uh, United States is always sort of the one messing everything up. And the, the worst case of that was Obama in 2009. He just like threw a hand grenade at the whole system and it fell apart. So the, U the U.S. has been the biggest barrier to international climate cooperation and climate action. So if we could build a kind of Green New Deal type politics in the U.S., it wouldn't just have to be about decarbonizing the U.S. It'd have to be about transferring these green uh, technologies to the world. And, you know, it's kind of like similar to this vaccine issue, like allowing this technology to really be expanded to the entire world so that the whole world can deal with this global issue instead of just the wealthier, the wealthier parts of the world. Yeah, well, I mean, if Biden's not going to waive vaccine intellectual property uh, protections, I doubt he'll do it for uh, electric vehicles or solar or whatever. You know, I mean, like the, the United States is behind, frankly, in terms of mm -hmm. like capitalist terms on mm -hmm. on the production of those because of the strength of the Republican Party uh, in this country. So they're going to try to milk that once that's more uh, more widely proliferated for everything um, that it's worth. And I, I just I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit about the concept of how deindustrialization in the United States has influenced this debate, um, because largely the the uh, for decades, the, the United States has been 
um, a service economy for the most part. Mm -hmm. Industrial uh, production has been outsourced in uh, to other nations, poorer nations, and we're bearing the brunt of that during COVID in terms of like the global supply chain being so complex that's been disrupted and the United States does not have the capability or redundancy uh, here domestically to, 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 to reckon with it. But I also think it influences the politics around climate change that um, in a way that it, it, it is not uh, influenced or it's more unique here than it is in other nations. Do you agree with that sentiment? And um, how so, if, if so? Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue because ultimately um, climate change is about our industrial production system. It's the industrial revolution uh, 250 years ago was about essentially using coal, a fossil fuel to power these mechanical machines like steam engines and eventually locomotives and that and that kind of big industrial breakthrough was rooted in fossil fuels. And that's kind of, we're still stuck with this problem where we use fossil fuels to power these really incredible machines that are rooted back in the industrial revolution. Um, but as, as you were hinting, like essentially what's happened is the United States and many other rich countries went through this industrial revolution and the working class got quite organized and built up incredible power uh, through unions and political parties to to actually build a political regime that benefited those workers to some degree. Um, and this kind of reached its heyday in the post uh, World War II era of, um, uh, you know, like this sort of Fordist, uh, high, high unionized regime where capitalism for a short 25 years was actually like, rel like sort of redistributing wealth in a somewhat egalitarian way. But of course, as you suggested, what happened was capital got, um, you know, their profitability started to suffer and they decided, well, we don't want to deal with these unions and this 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 redistributive states anymore. So we're going to offshore capital around the world or we're going to automate um, away these jobs to get rid of these pesky unionized workers. And that kind of process really disempowered the industrial working class and and uh, really hollowed out a lot of these former industrial regions that we still see today, whether it be Ohio or Pennsylvania, which has now become like Trump country, you know. And, and at that same time was where we saw the rise of, yes, a service economy, which was, which was based on like extremely low wage, precarious type of work, but also this sort of rise of higher education as this pathway to a sort of a more secure knowledge economy. And that just sort of widened the wider inequality in society as a whole. So you have this, this problem where um, the crisis is caused of climate change is caused by our industrial production system. But most people in our society don't have a lot of contact with that system. And the PMC people r really just sort of look at industrial production as just the stuff out there that's kind of causing injustice and causing harm, and we just need to stop it. Um, but I think reviving kind of that old, more sort of old socialist tradition of like actually building up working class power over the industrial production system to transform it, to seize it and transform it is, is actually what we need to recover, because that's ultimately what the climate crisis is really about. It's about building a bunch of new industrial stuff. And you can, a, a big wind farm, there's very few things that are more industrial than that. But it's going to have to include a whole host of other things like transmission lines and even things like possibly like nuclear plants. And, and, and this industrial infrastructure is, um, is what, we, what we ultimately need to, need to transform. But we, again, have experienced sort of decades of disempowering the workers that, have, that really do the work in those industrial systems. So I, uh, before we, we wrap, I wanted to... Uh pick your brain on the concept of degrowth, right? Where, you know, I, I sometimes will have people write in and say that degrowth politics are the way to go in order to combat climate change. Um, and and uh, I am incredibly skeptical of those kinds of arguments because, uh, again, I, I don't find it feasible, nor do I think it is... Uh, nor do I think that it fits into the like the larger class struggle that we want to emphasize here. But w what is your opinion on some of those calls and how that fits into um, the, the larger climate debate? Well, um, you know, 
the whole problem is if you look up degrowth, if you look up D as a prefix, it means less. It means privation. It means we're gonna like scale down. And and if you if you look around um, about it's a various definitions of degrowth, it's always centering reduction less, how to live better with less. It's it centers downscaling. And 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 ultimately, their their politics really focuses on this kind of aggregate scaling down of the economy. Um, and I I should say because I I get in trouble on these debates that there's a lot of things they propose that I would agree with. They propose decommodifying social you know public services. They propose um, a shorter work week and things like this that any leftist is going to be behind. You know, but this the way in which they they frame uh, the debate is always centering less and always centering reduction. And again, um, for the mass of the working class for, in countries like the United States, so-called rich countries, um, they've seen nothing but less for the last several decades. They've seen stagnating wages. They've seen uh, their benefits cut. They've seen the, the, the welfare state hollowed out. And um, so always centering less in a, a politics of reduction to a working class that is already suffering through austerity is just strategically doesn't make a lot of sense. And um, a, a more traditional class struggle approach to politics is to say, we need to, you can even say degrow the rich. We need <laughs> to take from the rich to give more, to give uh, a, a increase uh, to the working class and to the masses and, you know, less for the um, few and more for the many. So this kind of class struggle is about is about really taking um, from the rich to make life for everyone better um, and more secure. And when you talk about either growth or GDP growth, it's always at the aggregate of society. It's kind of like this aggregate measure that conceals the more divisions and class struggles in society. Yeah. And, and so we really need to have that language of, of division and conflict between, between classes. Uh, and the one last thing I'll say is they often say, yeah, yeah, we, we get that. And we don't want to degrow the poor countries of the global South, right? We just, we just want to degrow the rich countries, right? But when they when they even say that, they'll often say we're going to degrow the global north, but this will allow the global south countries to grow. But as I was just suggesting, global north countries are not these aggregate entities. They have huge amounts of poor people and right. struggling working class people. So saying that we're going to degrow your whole country doesn't help this problem either. And and in terms of those politics, it sounds a little bit too close to austerity politics, and we always know who blame, who bears the brunt of austerity mm -hmm. politics. For sure. All right. Well, uh, Matt Huber, can't thank you enough. Uh, amazing discussion today. Uh, author of Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. Uh, Matt, we'll put your the link to your book in the podcast description and in the YouTube description and anywhere else that you are listening slash watching this program. Uh, thanks so much for your time today, Matt. Really appreciate it. Good to talk to you again. Really great honor to be on the program. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, an honor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>